Hello, everybody. So, as you know, um, Unseen is particularly exciting for the fact that it encourages artists to show works which have never been seen before in its premiere presentations. And as part of that exciting moment, we'll be speaking to six fantastic artists today here. So, introducing first of all, we have Esther Teichman over here and Martin Palaki. So, Martin, if you want to start. Um, okay. So, how does this work? Oh, okay. So, so just next. Press. Exactly. <laughs> so, hello. So, Martin is a London based artist um, creating really brilliant works which always draw on an element of the sculptural, I think, in my opinion at least. That's correct. Um, introducing gesture and characters, and there's like a sense of the, of the surreal. So, I thought it'd be really interesting, first of all, if you could just introduce your series that you're showing here. So uh, actually the series that I'm going to show you is, has not much to do with gestures, <laughs> to be honest. So what you see in the, um, above me is uh, my previous book series that I've uh, finished in 2016. And this is basically what led me to start a, a quite different um, series that I haven't finished yet which are uh, shop windows, basically. So the reason why I started this series is <clears throat> the El Amer story was pretty much about um, staging situations and uh, kind of wanted to get away from that a little bit because I, 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 I guess my mind unconsciously needed some sort of a rest from that. Uh, way of working. So, I'm I'm from Budapest, Hungary, and uh, I went back to my home city and walked around a lot, and so a lot of very interesting, mostly abandoned uh, windows, and um, and I just started taking pictures of them, uh, just uh, not really uh, as like a different form of uh, working, basically. And yeah, these are some of the pictures that uh, came out from this, from this approach, and I'm still working on this series um, simultaneously with, with other uh, projects that I'm doing, but this is one that uh, I'm showing at Unseen at uh, the Weber Gallery stand, which is stand 47, I think. Um, yeah, um, how did you find the process of moving away from working with characters? I know that when we've spoken previously about your work, you mentioned that you like to find a person who really encapsulates this moment for you and use them as a starting point. So in this process, did you find that the windows kind of played the same role? I think it was more of a... What I really enjoyed about uh, working and what I still enjoy working on this series, that it's, it's somehow... A, a different process that I'm used to working. So it's just the, the new approach is very satisfying for me. Also, it, it is kind of a pretty pure observational type of photography, which I'm, which I'm less, uh, um, which I was less interested um, in the previous uh, project. And I'm just finding it really satisfying that I'm basically creating these uh, these uh, abstract uh, images. And what was the of your experiences taking these pictures in the shop windows? What was your favorite? Do you have any anecdotes from the process? Well, this one is is one of my favorites. For example. Uh, when I, while I was taking this photograph, a man came up to me. This is in London. And I was really into the process of taking the picture. And he just like came up to me, st stood in front of me and said, I'm going to kill you, you so and so. And walked away. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if, if this considered to be an anecdote, yeah, this is. Uh, he probably thought that I'm some sort of a creepy guy who is taking photographs of uh, hair on shop windows. 
<laughs> well, this is a different series that I'm still I'm working on um, uh, simultaneously, which is again going back to uh, the same uh, um, kind of work that I'm used to doing. So it's more staged and more uh, about uh, characters and and. Uh, yeah, and it's just it's just very nice that I have this two balance doing one thing and then just like a, having a like a little break and take a breath and do something completely different in terms of the process. Amazing. That's it. Do we still have time? Do you want to ask some question? Yeah, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask at all? I would really like to know uh, whether you find that the still life works that you make tend to fuel the, the, docu the more documentary photography. Is it that one drives the other forwards? I'm sorry? Do you find that one, when you make one kind of photography, one kind of image for a while, that then that drives you to create the other as a kind of counterpoint to it? Well, definitely, yes. So. Um it is also a very interesting process that the, that uh, because you're you're uh, trying it out a different sort of way of working, and I keep saying this because this is one of the most interesting thing for me. I could talk about the the abstraction of the work and so on, but I think what is the most interesting for me at the moment in this series is that I, it gives me pure satisfaction. Um, and I don't know where this leads me, but I know that certain aspects of this work can fuel another series for sure. So I really like the way of this sort of organic way of working. So one thing leads to another, even though the two doesn't really connect in the sense of uh, 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 title or ideas. And will you be at the stand, at the Weber Gallery stand, to be able to chat to people about your work? As Tomorrow, well? yes. Tomorrow. You must go down and see it. It looks fabulous. Um, Thank you. We'll move on to Esther. Thank you. I think we have um, bald heads and hair in common. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. Um, so to introduce Esther Teichman, she is also a London-based artist. This is the London contingent for today. Um, she makes very rich, uh, otherworldly, almost mystically infused images, and this uh, at Unseen, she'll be presenting a series called Heavy the Sea, which is what you've come to talk to us about today. So I wonder if you could just give us a quick introduction to the series. Sure. Um, and I have mixed in some earlier works as well, okay. just to kind of give a context of installation. And I think really similar to what you said, Martin, about a process where my process really unfolds. No? Closer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in a sense, I don't really work in one finite series and then on to the next, which um, is, yeah, it's a much more of an unfolding of one thing connecting to the next and references that aren't overt but kind of feed in quietly and then inform the next thing. Um, so the titles, Heavy the Sea, are often kind of come around in terms of having to title exhibitions or having to title publications, where it's like, what's the show called? Um, and I'll often revisit earlier work and then put it into a new context. So almost like a body of work that increases and then is like reconstituted in different contexts. So, so Heavy the Sea was the title of a show um, at a... Um, at a museum space in Cleveland called Transformer Station. And um, the title comes from, and that came out of um, a show two years ago at uh, Zephia, um, a museum space in Mannheim, Germany, Reis Engerhorn, that Ed spoke about earlier, Ed Clark. Um, and the title is borrowed from uh, the poet Rainer Maria, Maria Rilke's Sonnets to Orpheus, written in 1922. Um, and it's just a sort of fragment of a line that talks about um, heavy are the mountains, heavy the seas, when he's talking about uh, depression and sort of the creative process. So he wrote this in kind of a fury. He wrote sort of his most well-known work in this sort of creative fury that he talked about in this really um, intense period after not making work for a decade. And yeah, and I've been really interested in kind of working across mythology in different ways and always working between um, autobiography and fiction. So that kind of slippage between, and writing comes into it a lot. So um, 
Heavy the Sea was also came from also the title of a short story that I wrote uh, that was part of a zine that was sort of free as a handout in the museum space that had short stories and images. Um, and so, the yeah. sea and water and oceans generally tend to be quite a prevailing theme in your work, don't they? Can you tell me about the importance of those big bodies of water and what they symbolize? Yeah, this was an earlier piece from uh, about a year and a half ago, and that so water quite literally or sort of allegorically in sort of dripping paint or um, is in a lot of the work or kind of in skin that is lit in a way that looks liquid. And I guess I'm interested in it um, in terms of a sense of inherited homesickness is often kind of a part of my work and looking at the relationship between photography and loss and desire. And I guess water in different ways is obviously our kind of original element in space and is also somewhere um, in terms of the oceanic as a space that is actually something that we know even less about than, than kind of the moon in space. And I'm just interested in it as a space of fantasy and desire, but also of fear. And so I've used it kind of in terms of mythology and a relationship to female sexuality, and, but also in terms of thinking about now, um, politically and in terms of the moment, the sort of anthropocenic age that we're in, in terms of also the horror of that. So kind of the desire to be part of something else, to lose your bodily weight, mm -hmm. to kind of immerse yourself in something, um, but then that also being something that can turn into something horrific. Does that make sense? No, I think immersion is a really good word for it as well, because as this image shows, your work is so much about installation and mm -hmm. about creating those spaces in which you really do feel like you're part of the scene where you become part of the image. And that sense of, of loss and of grief and of, of uh, I think, as you said, homesickness is, again, mm -hmm. kind of comes to the fore. I think it's quite difficult to escape, isn't mm -hmm. it? Can you tell us about this image? I'm always wondering about this picture, actually. Yeah, what, what, I don't know, I just, I just want yeah. to know the story behind it. So I was working with um, shells in a not so subtle way as like, <laughs> um, as orifices and, um, and was always interested in, sort of follies throughout Europe and this sort of um, orientalist fantasy of kind of appropriating all different. So shell grottos exist you know, all over um, kind of Europe, but there are a lot of amazing ones in Britain. And I was interested in this sort of appropriation of different uh, visual references um, and the decorative, but also this is, yeah, this is a shell um, grotto on the coast in England. Um, and this one actually particularly, it's not quite the sort of use and origins aren't quite known. So that's known, exactly. So that sort of sense of the mystical and um, transgressive in terms of, yeah, my assistants at the time. <laughs> like, yeah, so often I'm working with myself, with my sisters. Um, I worked for many years with my little sister who for many years had a shaved head. And like, I was always interested in that as well in terms of um, kind of gender. And yeah, and then interested in sort of hair as well in relationship to kind of abjection and beauty. Um, so very yeah. literally as well as metaphorically you're bringing absolutely. the autobiographical and the mythological together to kind of collide. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And seaweed, so I started working with um, seaweed a few years ago. I probably need to stop soon, but um, I was kind of, <laughs> I was, I was, I've always been really obsessed with Hokusai's um, woodcut of the fisherman's wife, uh, the dream of the fisherman's wife, or sometimes it's called girl diver and octopuses. So that amazing um, woodcut of this pearl diver, seaweed diver, and, and the sort of octopus um, oral sex. It's an incredible, beautiful woodcut. And I, and I was thinking about sort of that, the, the sort of anthropomorphic, um, yeah, um, nature of seaweed. And of course, also thinking about in the installation with Flowers Gallery um, here at Unseen includes a cyanotype sort of montage collage where I was playing with like an homage to Anna Atkins, so it's called Heavy the Sea, and in brackets kind of for Anna. And thinking about Anna Atkins, who was um, a botanist, um, 19th century botanist, but also thought of as one of, or the first female photographer, and the creator of possibly the first photo book um, that was a sort of encyclopedia that were cyanotypes of British seaweed from all around the Isles, and she was really um, obsessed with seaweed. And so it was kind of Anna Atkins gone, gone mad. Um, and that sense of that they become like these sort of jellyfish octopus creatures when, and so I have been making those for the last few years all over the world where I am and collecting seaweed and 
passing around. Yeah. And you'll be, will you be around the Flowers Gallery stand to be able to chat to people about your work as well, if anyone wants to come and have yeah, a chat? Yeah, I'm around the rest of the day, and yeah, I fly out late tonight, but I'm definitely around yeah. and we'll hang out at um, I really do yeah, insist you go see it as well. It's, it's, it's quite something. I think that that space really does feel quite enveloping, doesn't it? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank That's you. everything we have time for. Thank you so cool. much. No worries. Thank we'll you. We'll welcome up our next two artists. Thank you so much. So, next, if Alex, Marie, and Douglas Mandry could come on up. Feels a little bit like a dating show, doesn't it? <laughs> Should I just welcome my contestants? I'm not actually sure who's first in this presentation, so you'll have to click for me so that I can find out. You can so just go along one. one. Fabulous. Uh, Alex Marie. Yep. Um. So Alex, you're a French photographer. Um, I've recently just won the, I've just been awarded the Foam Talent Prize as well, with, along with the shortlisted artists. Uh, yeah, it's 20 of us selected. Um, and yes, I am French from Paris, and I studied at St. Martin's and the Royal College in London, so I've been based there for 10 years. Um, I work across photography and sculpture, and I make a lot of insulation and sculpture, sculptural work with photographs that I print onto different materials. Um, I think that, yeah, it would be easier to start with this, which was my uh, degree show installation, <clears throat> sorry, at the Royal College. Um, it was called Orlando, and it was made of um, 200 close-up prints of my um, lover of the time that I then dipped in wax and crackled and then scanned and reprinted and then I printed 200 uh, prints of it and turned it into this installation. Um, and then, oh, well, that's actually how it started, how the whole process started, so this picture comes first. Um, I think one of the things that's so interesting about your work is the fact that while the images themselves are really visceral, actually the process too, the fact that you're photographing and then creating a sculpture and then photographing again, it really feels like um, something kind of consuming itself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very much a never-ending loop. Mm. Um, and yeah, the, f the photographs just digest themselves. But um, in the, like about the process of it, I work around the body and about I mean, the idea of the surface of the print and the surface of skin as a similar thing mm -hmm. and what it does to print pictures of the skin onto different materials and to cut through them and turn them into different shapes. But um, I am looking for kind of physical responses and experiences, but that's for me when I'm making them work as much as for um, the show when people encounter the and work the as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then for... And scene. Um, basically, I've been working on uh, this book, my first book, for about three years, and it just came out. And um, it's a book where all the images um, that I use in my in my archive, or the images I shoot to then turn them into installation, um, are in the book. Um, and I didn't think that it was going to happen, but it did, which is that now I started turning the pictures in the book into sculptures. Mm. So it's like, To again, be photographed again and then shown exactly. in this way. Exactly. So yeah, this is a double spread where I just um, printed pictures, um, rolled them around and took a picture of it for the book. And I thought it was going to stop there. But then I was thinking of the frame as just a, a loop and a 3D mm. object. So it's perspective. Um, and this is uh, printed on plastic PVC, um, which is, um, I started working with this material um, uh, during a residence in Morocco, because I, um, I couldn't really print much, I was there for a short time, and um, I didn't want to, well, I wanted to be respectful of the, the culture there as well. Mm. Um, and I found um, a huge hoarding of a four meter um, hand print, I mean, it was an advertising for um, 
of phones and I was very interested in how the female body can still not escape objectification even though you're not allowed to, to show much of the body but still for a phone it was a woman's hand and I started um, photographing this uh, hoarding and then I just started making my own. I think that's all the images. Amazing. Oh yeah. And then there's the cat. <laughs> What's the story behind the cat? Um, well, uh, similar to Hester, I work. My work crosses between um, mythology and autobiography, and I'm preparing a show in Düsseldorf, and it's going to be um, the, this is kind of the central theme is going to be Hippolyta, who's um, the queen of the Amazons in the in the Greek mythology. And I was just looking at kind of different myths and to construct the show really as like a bit as a story. And so I was looking at um, the Sphinx, which uh, in the mythology asks you a riddle uh, before you can go in. Um, and so I decided to photograph a Sphinx cat because they're called like that. That's gorgeous. That's it. Thank you. And will you be around the fair to chat to people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, can you remind them which stand it is? Huh? Can you remind me which oh, yeah, it's is? Materia Stand, which is uh, booth 11. Fabulous, thank you. Thanks so much. And Douglas, introducing Douglas Mandry. Um, Douglas is a Swiss, a Swiss artist based in Zurich. Can you tell us about the work that you're showing? So I would like to start with the picture. Oh, yes, this one, because <clears throat> this one is taken from a, a previous work I did and explains a little bit the, the reason why I came up to do the, the work that is exhibited now in, uh, in, the, in my gallery in Unseen. So um, my work, I usually work in several steps. I don't um, take a picture and accept it as being finished. So um, I started earlier by um, taking pictures when traveling, uh, for example, here in the, in the Swiss mountains, uh, which is a, a typical Swiss uh, type of photography. And um, once I got the pictures, I would come back to my studio, uh, print the picture in a, in a large format, and start to work with them in order to create something new. Um, uh, so it's basically what I would do with Photoshop, but I just decided not to use any uh, digital device to do so. So if you want, the, the holes you see, the stars you see on these beautiful mountains uh, are actually punched holes in the print and, and lit from behind and photographed again. So I always work within several steps and layers on my own pictures. and. So this was the, the starting point of using really photography as a as a raw material to mm. uh, it's almost stepping out of photography and go with, going towards a form of sculpture. Mm. And so basically, for my new um, the new work I'm showing, I could show another picture here. Um, so there pictures where, um, well, I took them in, in East Turkey in the site of Cappadocia, which is also a very touristic uh, place. And so I got interested in the idea of capturing a moment or documenting a place in which you, you travel using photography. And this idea of capturing the moment is something I try to, to distort or to, to, to modify in this process. And basically, I took material where I took, the, I took photographs and I brought back stones from, the, from the, the place I visited. So I came back in Switzerland with a lot of negatives, but also a lot of raw material from the from the place and it's you know like some fetish um, memories of, of traveling and I wanted to be able to include the material within the photography itself in the photographs itself so basically I work with photograms which you see here um, so the stones I put on the uh, on the paper during the the ex expo like development the, of the, the picture, so they're included. So, so you're literally adding this raw matter into the pro into the process of developing the images, so that it's physically included. Exactly, and that creates a sort of loop as well, where nature is being photographed. So we use nature by photographing it, mm -hmm. and it actually takes over during the process of of developing and actually altering the the photograph because it creates this this holes and this 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 um, uh, distortion on the picture. Actually, so this is just one. Um, uh, I work with different materials. I started working also with sea, uh, sea water, sea salt, and um, the photos are 
very recent, so they're not included in this PDF. They're very fresh. <laughs> and uh, I invite you to see them at the uh, booth number 20. So yeah, a few more examples of this, this work uh, awesome. that I'm developing now. Yeah. And what I think is really interesting about the way that you work in this process is that it takes elements of photography and staying very true to photography's history and you know the production and obviously working with photograms in the first place is such a physical and yes mm -hmm. but it's then a, also you're kind of almost mapping aren't you you're almost mapping spaces by taking actual parts of the environment and putting yeah, them back into the landscapes mm -hmm. exactly it's the, the idea of being as much like bringing as much reality as i can within the photograph if you take this the 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 way I proceed is very similar to uh, documenting like geologically a, a space where you just know exactly which material comes from which uh, location. Mm -hmm. And actually this very, say, scientific approach actually gets lost completely within the, last, within the, the result uh, where you can't recognize the place, you cannot um, feel. You, you, it's just a very organic way of, of working mm -hmm. instead of... of uh, of scientific in the end. So, uh, you lose the connection somewhat, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And what's next for you? You mentioned a moment ago when we were chatting that you've just taken some new, super new images. Uh, yes, because the idea of working with nature, I like to, to develop this idea with this project. So it's a long-term project. I don't see an end yet to, to the series, but um, the idea is to work with non-photographic material and natural elements. So always with this idea to, to document places and use the the places as natural resource to actually uh, influence the photograph. So it's, it can lead to many different possibilities. And I j that's what I was saying. I just came back from 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 the south and the sea. So I, I I've been digging um, negatives in the in the seawater for a while and see what happened. And um, so it's a very random process. I don't have much decision, but this part of chance is also something I'm looking for. I look for it within this, this process. I try to give up uh, as much control as I can and, uh, and see, see actually what happens during like, confronting the photographic chemistry, let's say, to, mm -hmm. to random natural elements. So um, this is it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if, again, you. if you have any questions for either Alex or for Douglas, they'll both be at their stands a little while. Absolutely. So do pop by and say hello. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, you too. Thank you. And then finally, we'll be speaking to Ali Mabasa and Tanya Habjukwa. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind just clicking along, sorry, Ali. I'm not sure who's, oh no, no, sit, sit. Do sit closer, um, but clicking along on the presentation, I'm just not sure who's next. Wow. Ali. So, Ali Mavasa, you yes. are a London-based artist and you create works which um, look at themes of identity and displacement, but through personal collections. Do you think that seems... Yeah, it's become objects. more collections. The photography is getting pulled more and more out of it mm. over the years. Um, this um, series um, I have at the moment is um, these, there's 107 of these stamps and they've been just randomly chosen by the Unseen team, but it doesn't really matter what, <laughs> it doesn't really matter what you're looking at because there's 107 of them, so they all tell individual stories. Um, um, some of them have a lot of information, like that one. But um, basically what happened was in 1979, um, the Iranian Revolution happened. I was three years old, and we left Iran um, because we had to, because of my grandfather being a general um, under the Shah, and we were traveling all over the place, um, Saudi Arabia first, then London for a while, and then Costa Rica, where my father was working for a while, and then from there, my parents separated. Me and my mother went to Maryland in USA. Um, I was around six or seven then, and there was all these posts coming in from Iran. And um, I was just, my grandmother would sit there cutting out like coupons and I'd sit there and cut out stamps. And, um, and she saw my interest and then she showed me how to soak the stamps in hot water and peel them and dry them. And then when I was eight, I moved to London um, to live with my father and I carried on collecting stamps till about the age of 12, at which point I was like, I'm not really a stamp collector, this is not cool. <laughs> 
social life. So adolescence, adolescence began, stamps went onto my dad's shelf. And um, basically, I went to art college. My work eventually becomes about being an Iranian out of Iran, displacement and identity come into it. death in the family. I have a child. Stamps. Stamps come back. So the process uh, of rediscovering this collection, how, how did that come about? Were you literally digging through old documents? No, the stamps were always there. The stamps were always there. Yeah. My work, it became relevant to my work. It wasn't any longer my stamp collection. It was part of my story, which I was... My work photographically, I worked through the photographic industry. I was in the system for a long time. So it was always about trying to wow. And, then I, wasn't, and I was always coming up with ideas and stories which were almost appetizing. Mm. They were like creative ideas, but then I'd see the idea over there and I'd see the idea over there. And, I was, and then finally I was like, I've got all these stories or issues or whatever it is. So that's my story. So I want to start telling my story. But it took me a long time to get there because it wasn't very comfortable mm. talking about those things when you just want to be normal as a young person. Mm. Um, so it took me a long time to actually be able to come out with these stories. So the stamps, and then to be able to, be able to look at the stamps in that kind of mm. in that perspective was a was a new thing for me. And then what happened was, so I photographed the stamps, um, and then I. I still haven't been back to Iran, um, but I speak the language fluently, I celebrate my culture, but it's, so it's this weird thing not ever having gone back to Iran. Mm. Um, I am at Photo London 2016. I just, um, I was seeing the Lens Culture guys because I won an emerging talent thing with them from another series of very personal work. And so I was just walking around and I see this gallery from Tehran. I'm like, it's weird, Tehran gallery, so you don't often see that. Um, I start chatting to the lady, Simin Dokhtekhani, who runs AG Gallery in Tehran. We start chatting, show her some work. She sees the stamps. She's like, I want to show these stamps. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's really interesting to hear that they're so ordinary to you as well, because it's the same for me. I see them as this very d domestic series of almost souvenirs from this long and actually quite awful period of exile, you know, and although maybe in the day-to-day, -day, actually, there's, it's not necessarily so terrible, it speaks of a much greater story, I think. It's, yeah, the stamps themselves tell a story, but I didn't want to be, I didn't see them as a, they're very historical. You know, they go from 1979 to 1989. It's like the revolution, the Iran-Iraq war. There's a lot going on. There's propaganda. It's their message to the West. But for me, I just looked at it as a child's stamp collection. I was just seeing bright colors and just like machine guns and bleeding tulips. I didn't really like, you know, that's what I was seeing. Um, I'm learning more about them now, and they're, edu they're educating me now. Um, so, but what happened was these, um, this, these things that were like my physical connection to Iran as a child ended up being the thing that took me back to Iran for the first time this year. So um, she invite, instantly invited me to Iran to put on a show of these stamps, all 107 of them. Um, I didn't think I was going to go because I was scared because of my grandfather and my father and this other various reasons. And then my, that, so I meet Simin in March. In August of that year, my father passes away suddenly. And I'm like, I've got to go. That's it, I'm going. So I go there, I'm, I meet loads of old family. I go to see my grandfather's house, Amazing. which was um, taken away by the government. And so it's now a girl's high school. So I go to my grandfather's house for the first time. And like, I go into like the science room, which used to be my dad's bedroom. So it was just a surreal trip. Um, and, then, um, and then the show is happening right now in Tehran. And um, Must yeah, feel like I took my wife and my son with me as well. So, that's amazing. Yeah. Something of the end of an era, I guess, to be able to see them go full circle like that, to leave the country in that situation, which is so far less than ideal, and to take them back there under much, much nicer circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So it was, um, it, that's, it was just a nice, simple story going you know, full circle. So That's yeah. wonderful. And will you be at the stand, uh, the Gallery AG stand? Yes, so I will like be. I will be, and I'll probably be there a bit tomorrow morning as well. So, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And um, Tanya, so. Sorry, I didn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing Tanya Habjukwa. 
Um, forgive me, my pronunciation, I'm sure it's not very good. It's and you're, close, you're close. based in East Jerusalem, aren't you? Yes. And you are a photojournalist and documentary photographer making work about um, politics and, and uh, the social situation and gender. And I just think the, the themes that you draw on are so broad. Um, can you tell us about the series that you'll be showing this weekend at Unseen? So I would say that I, in the last five years, have I really wouldn't define myself as a photojournalist. I have worked in photojournalism, and I still will in order to eat, mm -hmm. because I think in our field we have to be very creative. Um, but I draw more from a conceptual theme of uh, war, politics, representation. And I employ a method in Arabic that I call the which is from underneath and underneath. I try to find, because especially in the region that I work, there's a lot of uh, assumptions, misrepresentation, reductive uh, storytelling. And so I always, especially, uh, I, I'm not Palestinian. I'm actually from a minority group, originally from the Caucasus, which has lived in the Middle East since the Ottoman period. So I'm Jordanian on one side and Texan on the other. And uh, actually, uh, related to a lot of your stories, oh, really? including come full, coming full circle to changing my uh, storytelling with my firstborn child. Anyway, uh, so I found myself in Palestine. I have a Palestinian husband, but that's not my story. But suddenly, it began, you know, I, I now have two small children, and I'm raising them, them in this context. So I suddenly, in an intense dissatisfaction with I, I was always irritated with my background in anthropology. Uh, I always critiqued the media. My master's, I did a, a dissertation on the topic. But it suddenly became much more of an urgent need for me to create work that represented the reality that my daughter would recognize. And so uh, thematically, I've been finding different entry points to Israel and Palestine. People always assume that they know. And I myself am bored by a lot of those images. And so uh, with this newest project, um, it's part of a trilogy. Uh, the past one was Occupied Pleasures. I've now got Sacred Space Oddity, the Un slash Holy Land, which is exhibited here mm -hmm. uh, at the Ilex Gallery. And uh, the next one is We Are All Children of Nine Months, which is from a, um, an Arabic proverb about equality. So this particular, uh, I, I usually try to employ an, an ironic black humor. And like a lot of the participants uh, that we're speaking today, I play with mythology as well. But I, I think in that particular setting, the reality is so absurd that the reality is almost more intoxicating and bizarre than the mythology. And uh, I, I, I tried to employ a sort of surrealistic playfulness to approach uh, and experience it differently. And so the unholy land uh, is playing subversively and playfully and respectfully with the notions of how religion f frames uh, and supposedly explains the conflict. But uh, And it's like a, essentially a road trip through uh, the unholy land uh, and char intimate character studies. Mm. And I find that the common theme, at least from what I know of your work, I don't again, I don't want to be reductive, is that you enter through this real point of humanity, and that I think is almost where the absurd comes in, because actually, the hum, you know, the that intrinsic human nature does come down to this humour, and to see some of these images in which we almost find ourselves trying to push ideas onto them, actually the humanity really comes through and that is where it feels really funny and absurd and, and brilliant for me. Um, can you tell me a little bit about those entry points that you mentioned? What were you, where were you expecting to go with the project? Well, um, I tried to find characters. So this is the first time that I've actually uh, directly addressed Israelis and Palestinians within the same uh, project. And I'm trying to, myself, uh, you know, perhaps I've experienced a certain aspect, uh, a political aspect and reality of this place. But in using religion and, and not being from a religious background myself, um, I accessed characters that normally would, would be very problematic for me. And some of them were, uh, okay, right-wing settlers, fine. In, in news assignments, I've accessed them. But it was trying to go a level further. And for example, the New Temple Movement. Uh, these are people who uh, were talking about 
1.5 by 13.5 meters. Like that's the size of the Dome of the Rock. And mm. that is the most intractable piece in, in, in this very contested land. And so it was accessing these characters uh, and, and it was pretty surreal, some of the people uh, that, that normally would say no. And in one of the cases, it's a, it's a settler who lives in the Mount of Olives, surrounded by Palestinians, and she has to have private security to live there. And, and she's there because there's the window directly to the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. And the poverty with which she lived shocked me, but that's because it, it, it didn't matter. All that matters is this view of the temple because they don't believe that humanity begins until. So I was told outright, New York accent, excuse me, you know, we don't like you really. We don't like your work. We've researched you, but we think uh, maybe, you know, you've been sent as a sign from God. You're going to let these Arabs understand. They just, they need to understand <laughs> that uh, <laughs> this has to happen for all of humanity. We're doing this for all of humanity. And so to access her, I had to come in the role of motherhood has actually opened up an entire world for me That's there. And I had to, I showed up and uh, she was just freaking out, 10 children, and there was a, the biggest pile of laundry I've ever seen. And I said, hey, I'll help you. And so we sat down and started folding her laundry together. And I mean, I learned a lot. That was where I saw the poverty, because I mean, I've been in, uh, I covered wars across the region, refugee camps, and I'd never seen such stained, tattered clothes. But but it was like a level of belief that with a with a fervency. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of these photographs. I know that usually they come that there's text and they're accompanying text, which explains the story behind them. And I really do insist you go and read it because it's so insightful. Um, perhaps you could tell some of the stories. Sure. So text is an essential part of it. And you, if you go and see our exhibit, uh, it's part of a group show of three. Um, you're seeing it still, but this is actually going to be released uh, in about a month and a half. It's, I, I like to call it an Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole. And you enter the space and uh, it's, it's like, a, I don't know how many of you have seen Robert Altman's Tennessee, but uh, it's an ensemble cast of uh, intimate, sad, beautiful, perverse characters that really kind of jolt your assumptions about what you know. It's, it, they certainly jolt, jolted mine. Uh, this particular character, um, he's an Egyptian, right? He's better friendly like that. Mm, Can you guys hear me from like that? Or like that? Slightly closer. Anyway, um, he's an Egyptian Coptic priest, came from extreme poverty, and all he ever wanted was to be a priest. And he had extremely bad luck. I mean, it's not like they make a ton of money. In fact, the Egyptian Coptic uh, church is one of the poorer churches, but they never accepted him. And then finally, he had a meeting with a with a leader in the community, and he said, tell me about you. He said, oh, well, my mother's a single mom with, uh, you know, uh, five kids, and he sent, he sent him away and said, okay, uh, don't come back until you've figured out how to help your, your family. He scrubbed toilets in Beirut. Finally, he accessed uh, uh, his dream position, and he's been in Jerusalem in the Holy Sepulchre for about 15, 16 years. But so you see this, this is a spot of the Dead Sea with these, and it's just there, these, these, these sort of, you know, aging uh, uh, superheroes are just there decaying on the side of the beach. And so there's the decay as well of you know, heroes of uh, past mythologies, it's all there all around. Like I'm telling you, this surreal landscape, you don't really need to invent, it's, it's there. But uh, in the actual project, you will see a video of him from two Easter Easter's ago being accosted violently as he tries to go into the church. So I'm also playing with holy and holy and, and playing with the, the tensions from underneath. Uh, this is one of the characters. There's a, actually a short uh, film. But this is just a little gif from the film. Uh, he's one of the, he's a kid from uh, Jalazon refugee camp who wants to be uh, an astronaut. Uh, they they are Zionist nudist. Sorry, no, excuse me. That's very reductive. They would be considered Zionist lefties. They they. They're nudists for fun. Uh, she's actually uh, quite the academic, studied at Oxford, very smart, smart girl. And uh, yeah, they're madly in love and uh, are lightly politically engaged. And uh, again, you would need to read the text. I don't want to gloss over it. I, it could be glib, but uh, this is actually in the uh, Galilee Sea. Uh, this is in right outside of Ramallah. These are two little uh, young schoolgirls wearing uh, government uh, school uniforms. And there's not a lot of green or open spaces to access within the West Bank context. And 
when you enter the project, it's actually, I, I treat uh, text as image. And interestingly, as you accessed all of these different characters, no matter what their ethnicity or religious beliefs, they would quite often the phrase, they teach hate in their schools was, was said all around. And so I played with that. Uh, and actually, uh, the girls had their school books, and so there's also an exploration of uh, what indeed uh, their religion book was teaching, which was actually celebrating nature. I also looked for characters that I, I called uh, subverters, like the characters that sort of defied any attempts of classification of uh, not necessarily Jew, Arab, or uh, agnostic in that sense, but in terms of defying the status quo themselves that were very rich, complex characters. And uh, Raviva, uh, this is Rabbi Haviva, she already, being a she, um, is quite liberal, but she runs a mikveh in the north uh, of Israel and opens up the mikveh to everyone, you know, to Goy, to, to, to Arab, Palestinian. And in fact, uh, for, for example, Israeli gay men who uh, uh, have surrogate mothers in Nepal, those children, by some of the more orthodox, would not be considered Jewish because the womb was not a Jewish womb, but she will perform, perform uh, conversions in her mikveh. So this is a portrait of her immersing. She actually invited me to immerse, and it's a, it, was, it was pretty fantastic. So that's the thing. It's like you're, I'm playing with these themes and, and realities and hard political representations, but I just wanted to find a fresh way to access them through intimate, uh, sometimes surprising and fun um, character examinations. Amazing. Thank you. Um, again, it's something of a whistle-stop tour, but I really do insist that everyone goes to see the works and to have a chat with the artists wherever possible. It's really fabulous, I promise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brilliant.